welcome, and then uh, we'll get started. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Shinnery. I work here at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Rensselaer County, New York, and I'm very pleased to be here today on our first uh, Lunch in the Garden webinar that we're going to be doing for 2024. We've got a whole series of these that are coming up, and if you want to visit our website, you can register for them there. You have to register for each one individually. Um, so the website, it's changed a little bit. It's Rensselaer, which is not an easy word to spell, .cce.cornell.edu. So Rensselaer.cce.cornell.edu. Um, if you go on to one of the search engines and type in CCE Rensselaer, it usually takes you there. And then go to our event page and you can sign up for all the different webinars that are coming up. They're on noon um, on Wednesdays, and we'll be going through um, a good part of April. So we've got a lot of neat things coming up, and I would urge you to register for those. For today, if you've got a question, please type it in the chat box at the end. We'll look, up, look in the chat box and take a, a few questions out of that and uh, answer those for you. So uh, our guest today is Ben Larson, and I've known Ben for a long, long time. Uh, he's lived in Troy for a long time and had a gardening business. It's Habitat Garden Design. And he's got a lovely, lovely home uh, on the outskirts of Troy, filled with deer food uh, of all sorts, beautiful, rare, exotic trees, shrubs, flowers. And we were just uh, chatting about the daffodils. That's from his daffodil collection there. So he's a great gardener and also a great horticulturist because he's worked in the field and been in our area for a long time, although I know he's from Long, long Island, although he doesn't really speak like that. So he's passing as an upstater like I am. <laughs> so we're really happy to have Ben here today, and he's going to talk about deer and certainly one of our biggest challenges in gardening in this part of the world. So I'm going to turn it over to Ben, and he's going to share his PowerPoint. Thank you. One minute to figure this out. Here we go. Okay, it looks good. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay. Great. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to share what I know about gardening with deer. I've been doing it for a long time. And thank you, David, for inviting me. And um, I've been on the receiving end of your presentations for a long time. So hopefully I've learned something from you. <laughs> you know, you're, you're very good at it. Uh, so yeah, we were just discussing, this is a photo my wife took in Del Mar and it's perfect for this. Um, yeah, it's really pretty. So um, let's see. I wanna just go over quickly about my background, why I know anything about any of this. Um, I started this business with my wife over 20 years ago. Um, I had no idea I was going to be doing this when I was younger. I started out as a landscaper working for nurseries and things like that. I ended up studying, um, uh, natural resources at Morrisville and I uh, was able to transfer to Cornell, which was a really great opportunity. Um, and I got my bachelor in science there. Uh, met my beautiful wife, Jamie, while she was studying horticulture there at Cornell. And um, we ended up working for a great area landscaper, Sandy Walk. Maybe some of you know her. She's in Del Mar. And uh, she got us our start over 20 years ago. Um, and I'm also a certified arborist uh, with the ISA. And I'm also a pesticide applicator in New York. And I treat trees and shrubs for diseases and insects. Um, but yes, one of the main things I've learned over all the years of gardening, over 20 years, is that it's very humbling, <laughs> and it and I will always uh, be learning new things. Um, so yeah, and I want to go over this really quick. Deer are really beautiful and amazing, and we conflict with them. Our desires conflict with deer. You know, they've been here for millions of years, and um, they're really filling a niche that we have created with all of our activities, our disturbances and gardening. And, um, you know, they deserve to exist and we deserve a beautiful, beautiful and healthy 
environment. So we have to balance these two things. So, so I'm gonna go over basically why we have a problem, where it came from. And then um, what's really important is to evaluate your particular situation because deer don't operate the same at everybody's yard. And so there's light pressure, moderate pressure and heavy pressure. So it'll help you evaluate what situation you're in and then what to do about it, which is really the good stuff is what we're here for. So um, we'll go over strategies to um, design as a strategy to minimize deer damage, um, selecting plants, you know, deer proof plants, deer resistant plants and deer candy. Um, the efficiency, the efficacy of uh, the usual strategies, which are, you know, sprays and barriers like fencing and stuff. And then um, I've been coming across some new products and, I, and, uh, and ideas, and I'm going to share some of those with you. Some I've tried, some I haven't tried, but I'll pass them along. And then um, I have a lot of plants that I use often in my designs that I have found to be very reliably deer resistant. <clears throat> so I have a, a bunch of those at the end that I'll go over. And then any questions anyone has, I'm happy to stay and answer. All right, so why do we have a problem? Well, this cartoon I think does a good job of uh, illustrating one of the reasons we have a, a problem now where we didn't have one 25, 50 years ago. Um, this is a, a cartoon of a, a bear, a deer, and a goose. They're having an alliance. They're creating an alliance, um, and it says the uh, strength of the black bear, the naked aggression of the Canada goose, and the speed of the white-tailed deer, combined with the overwhelming force of the spotted lanternfly. New Jersey could be ours. Um, I think it's it's pretty funny. Um, uh, it it just it it shows you know their numbers are increasing and they are moving back to areas they had previously been uh, extirpated from and um, there's a lot of reasons why this is happening um, but it's not just the deer uh, the bear the animals that used to be here there's also new animals coming too and um, you know it's interesting why this is happening you know um, over the last hundred years we've gone from you know, in around 1900, there was almost no forest left in the United States. So that whole Eastern uh, forest is grow has grown back, not the entire um, forest, but in a patchwork fashion. And um, a lot of it has grown back, has come back. And this is very good for deer, which is one of the reasons why their numbers are going up. Um, so yeah, their population has grown to uh, beyond their uh, historical numbers. Um, and so one misconception I run across a lot with people is that deer are starving and that they're suffering from human actions. And, you know, they do suffer in some ways. We have vehicle strikes and um, habitat destruction, but then we're creating new habitat for them. And um, we've gotten rid of their predators. Um, so their numbers are really changing. And, um, their behavior has changed too. People used to be, uh, you know, we used to hunt them and, uh, you know, they saw us as a threat and that's really not the case anymore. And that's happening with animals all across, uh, you know, the, the different species. You know, I have fisher cats in my yard. I never even knew what those were 15 years ago. And now they're all over the place. I have to worry about my cats and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, all over, actually all over the Eastern coast of the United States and all, really all over the world, especially in Europe and stuff, animals are moving back in closer to people because we have changed and we're not as much of a threat. And we also create great deer habitat. Um, and this just shows really quickly where the forest used to be on the Eastern seaboard. In 1850, it was a little reduced. And by 1920, it was almost all gone. And what you can see here on this uh, satellite image, this is taken recently, this is a NASA shot, of um, the, the forest has regrown in a large way. But there's still lots of areas where there's agriculture and civilization. 
And that is that patchwork type of landscape that deer really love. Um, so I think this is a, a miracle really uh, that we, have, we live in the regrowth of the Eastern forest that we're all here a hundred years later and, and the forest is largely, you know, back. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's not the same forest, it's different and it's always changing. We had all kinds of threats and things like that, but it is a forest. And to a deer, what we create looks a lot like the edge of a forest, you know, that, that edge habitat that they love so much. So you can see here is just the low herbaceous plants, medium woody plants and, you know, forest cover nearby. To them, this looks like a buffet, but to us, you know, it's a garden. So this also, this uh, graph here shows where we are now with deer, where this is white-tailed deer, the brown line here. And I don't know how accurate these numbers are here. This is back from the 1400s, the 1600s to the 1800s. And here at 1900, when the forest was at its least, the uh, deer population was also at its least. And here we are today, up over 30 million this is the best estimates we have. So we've gone from 300,000 deer, white-tailed deer in, the, in uh, North America to 30 million in less than 100 years. Um, and that's tremendous. That's a, like a thousand, you know, numbers are a thousand times. That's huge. So we all know what the problems are that deer cause. I'll go through this just real quickly. We have tick-borne illness, vehicle strikes. Ecological damage is the one that concerns us the most, obviously, because that relates to garden damage. Um, but you also have a lot of crop damage that they cause and um, impacts to deer health. There's diseases and things and starvation and uh, population crashes that can happen when they reach certain levels. So the most obvious sign of ecological damage that you can see just driving around is uh, the browse line. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but if you weren't aware when you're driving around, you can see often well, um, in places like where I live in Brunswick or Gilderland, you'll see a browse line on the edge of the forest. Uh, and this is the deer are just eating everything from five to six feet down. Um, and, you know, this is a nice shot because it shows uh, amelanch here flowering in the edge here. Um, but that, you know, in, the, in, in here, they're, they're just mowing everything down. So the same exact thing happens in our gardens, in our yards. We just can't see it because we don't have full foliage across our yard. Um, but they're doing exactly the same thing. Um, and this is what... I think of this as the worst case scenario. This is right uh, near my, uh, outside my yard and it's um, the forest. Um, there is hardly anything left growing. Now this is winter. So there, this will green up with uh, things like garlic mustard and um, bittersweet and um, a, a native plant that they don't like called white snake root. But, um, you can see here, there's no young trees coming. They have uh, killed all the tree saplings in the understory. So this is doing damage that's gonna last for a long, long time. Um, in only in, in our perspective, in geologically, you know, if, if the deer population was um, reduced, this would resolve itself. But in the next hundred years, this is gonna be um, a changed forest because as these larger trees mature, get wind blown or die, there's no new trees to take their place. So I, you know, I walk past this every day and, um, you know, it just looks bad to me, you know, uh, and I don't really see how this is going to change. I think this is a hot spot where, where deer are moving along this hillside or along the backside of my house. And so when they're really concentrated, this is what it can look like. Um, you can kind of see this here is a uh, wintergreen euonymus 
that was probably seated there probably over 50 years ago or something and has been growing uh, and it grew just fine for many, many decades and then they started eating it. So And this is more like what it should look like, obviously, is what you know you see um, walking around in, in a healthier understory. Um, this, this is actually a deer, uh, a heavy deer area, but they haven't done as much damage here. I think they, it's just not a hot spot. But I just wanted to show, you can see like here's oak seedlings coming and all kinds of, of, of varied um, ground cover and then lots of understory trees. You have a birch tree back here and all kinds of things. So even if, uh, you know, the larger trees fall down, there'll always be a forest regenerating, very different from what we just saw. Um, this is a cemetery that was near my house, and I just wanted to show how the browse line is a, is, is a recent thing. These trees have been here for 75 years or more, some of them. And so, um, <laughs> um, ah, sorry about that. I just want to show the browse line right here with um, this yellow line right here. These have been here for 50 years and the deer just started nibbling away at the bottoms of all of these trees. And um, so up here, they're escaped from that deer browse, but down below they are getting wiped out. And that's what's happening. The same thing that's happening in our yard. And I call it the deer apocalypse. Here is, are some photos of Eric. This is in Brunswick um, and in Del Mar and other places. These were used, these got totally uh, wiped out because they were not above the deer zone. Um, uh, this is hemlock right here. Um, this is rhododendron. You have, um, these are the use, you know, the important thing is that to know is that deer start damaging shrubs in, at, in a progression. They don't just start eating all the plants at the same rate. Um, they start on use. That's what I've noticed at everybody's house across all the different neighborhoods. Use are the first to go. And they will get used to eating these, and then they'll move on to hemlocks and they'll move on to rhododendron eventually. Um, but you know, this is what you see um, uh, first. Are you these are these are large use, and they're being sheared too. So shearing and deer damage is not a great combo for a plant. It can't last that long. Um, like these were, these were sheared and they were eaten by deer. And they, you know, they, they can do that for about six, seven years, maybe 10 at the most, if they are, get a chance to regrow in the summer, but little by little, they'll be killed. Sorry about that, it's annoying. Um, so yeah, that was what I was talking about with the progression. So um, it happens over a period of years and um, begins with ewes in the, in the winter, it's different than the summer. Um, you'll get the evergreens are mostly uh, damaged in the winter. Um, they generally leave the evergreens alone in the summer and move on to all your more delicious food, uh, your herbaceous plants. Um, but it's a similar thing in the summertime. Um, you'll have Mostly they'll start off on hostas and tulips and daylilies and flocks. Those are about their favorite plants. And once they get used to eating those on your property, then they'll start moving over to eating your hydrangeas. All types of hydrangeas are damaged by deer. Um, and then eventually they'll even go to things that we, you know, used to consider deer resistant, which was black eyed Susans and Shasta daisies and things like that. And once they, they, they start eating those, Basically, everything's on the menu at that point. Um, and I've, in in my yard, they even eat uh, bee balm or Menarda. They eat on my peonies um, that uh, usually later in the season, um, they go out and defoliate them. So it doesn't, they still flower, but, um, and they even eat my spirea, which is crazy. Uh, that's That we've always considered as a, like a deer proof plant but it, um, they, they keep mine pruned, is what I say. So there's different levels of, of deer pressure. You know, you have zero pressure, um, and that's like Disney World here. And then you have inner city um, uh, gardens that are fenced or, um, you know, the, there's no access 
uh, by deer. So you can have your tulips and all kinds of uh, wonderful things. Um, uh, it doesn't mean you have no pests though, because often these kinds of gardens have woodchucks is they're pretty notorious for digging under fences. <clears throat> um, so this is, yeah, this is your inner city areas. And, and for some reason, Loudonville has no deer. I don't know why it should, but uh, when I work there, I never see any deer. I don't know uh, what's going on over there, if they have some kind of secret program to keep them out. But um, then you have like light pressure areas. And these are funny because these are like pockets of um, Glenmont, Old Del Mar, um, parts of Latham, parts of Old Niskayuna. Um, if you're in those areas, there'll be deer moving through. You'll see them occasionally, but not like all the time. And you'll get light browsing on evergreens in the winter. And I'll show you what the beginning of nibbling looks like in a second. Um, because a lot of times the deer damage is happening. You don't realize it in these areas. Um, they're coming through at night and um, they're starting to accommodate themselves to your yard. And um, you might not even realize it. Um, there'll be some damage on newly planted arborvitae and hemlock. There'll be um, light browsing. They'll kind of move through and nibble a little bit here and there. You'll get some of your buds will be bitten off. You might not even notice or they might hit so, hit just a patch and then you won't have any damage for a while. So that's the kind of light pressure. You know, they're starting to move in, they're starting to accommodate themselves to your yard. And, uh, but you still, you don't really think there's much of a problem. It's kind of nice to see them. You know, they're very beautiful. But then it goes to, um, you know, uh, starts moving into moderate damage. Um, and this shows you just the tips of a, a plant. It's very hard to even tell. You know, this is what it, my juniper, this is at my house, I planted this, they love juniper. And um, I planted it to shield this shed. So I protect this one in the winter, but this is what the healthy tips should look like. And this is what they started nibbling right there. You can see it's like a lot of times people won't even realize that they're saying, oh, my, my bush is turning brown. You know, what's going on with it? Does it have a disease? And it's like, nope, that's actually deer are starting to nibble. And because they don't have sharp incisors like a bunny, they actually tear the foliage and break it. So it turns brown and it looks, you know, bad, um, but it's hard to identify. So I'm trying to show you here. It's a little hard to see, but that's just the, the torn edges of the of the juniper. And this is another plant, but, um, and that's what it's supposed to look like. Just nice and green to the tip, you know. So, um, when you have moderate, when you're in an area that's of moderate pressure, this would be like the green bushes, most of Del Mar, um, Voorheesville. Um, I'd, I'd say almost our whole area is is generally a, like a moderate deer pressure area. Um, you'll see deer all the time. Um, you'll have uh, quite a bit. You'll see some yards have a lot of winter uh, winter damage from evergreens, like their arborvitaes. Um, I'll show you some pictures of those in a second. Everybody's, I'm sure, seen it, but um, uh, but you still can get away with with certain plants. Like uh, azaleas are fine. Even rhododendrons might be fine. Um, you might look uh, on your your um, you might be fine. Your taxes, like your um, evergreen bushes, might be totally fine. You look across the street, and your neighbors are getting damaged. You know, so they're kind of moving in. They're moving through, um, um, but in the summer you'll see you can't grow daylilies. They eat all the buds off. They come right through and nip them off um, like a salad bar. Uh, hostas get um, whacked back like this. Uh, you see that the leaves will be, this can happen in one night too. You know, they'll come in and just like, I'll have a beautiful hosta there. And then the next day, this is what it looks like. Um, um, I don't know if, if people are probably familiar with Autumn Joy Sedum, uh, which is a wonderful plant, but the deer love it. They they just keep nipping those flower buds off from July until frost. Um, but generally, in a moderate deer pressure area, you can still grow things. Certain perennials just won't get touched, and that's Shasta daisies, black eyed susans, and stuff like that. So this is a not a great picture, but it shows those azaleas that are flowering right here. 
So this is a moderate area of deer pressure, but the ewes are getting hammered. So, and then these juniper, these are being sheared, so they're not the best looking things, but um, in, in heavy deer areas, these would be stripped too. Um, now this is getting into a heavier deer pressure area. These are ewes or, or taxus getting you know eaten. And you can see that brown that I was telling you about. Um, as they break those tips off, they it causes like a brown uh, browning of it. Here's rhododendron totally stripped. And whatever these were, these used to be something, Itea probably. And we've all seen this, I'm sure. These, this is emerald green arborvitae, which is a wonderful plant. Um, but it does a great job. It's great narrow, great for screening. Everybody loves them. You know, that great green color all, all uh, season long, but the deer just love them and go right to them. And I do quite a bit of fencing of these in the fall. So yeah, that was some uh, pictures of heavy, heavy pressure. And this is like the worst case scenario where you can't um, you know, grow a lot of different things. You have uh, rubbing damage uh, from bucks. Um, I've had you know, nice, really beautiful trees I've planted destroyed like that. So now I protect all my, the trunks of trees when I plant a new um, tree. Um, evergreens are eaten all winter. Um, you'll even have trails through your beds. So I've seen actually quite a bit of damage done by trails. Um, even through, uh, like, a, I remember there was one yard that was Pachysandra. Um, they wore a path through the Pachysandra, but they also, because there was so much of, you know, foot traffic through the bed, they uh, actually spread a fungal disease that Pachysandra are prone to. And it really deteriorated the bed. Now, I think that was my my guess as to what was going on. It was, they were being damaged and the fungus was being spread. So it's, it can be something like that. Um, and then you can't even grow things like black-eyed Susans or Shasta daisies or uh, any number of, of perennials. Like most of them, you're down to a, you know, a shorter list of like 10, 12 perennials that they, they won't touch, but um, almost everything gets eaten. Uh, I'll even seen um, a lot of pines and spruces will get wiped out at this stage. Um, so this is, you're going to see this like where I live in Brunswick, Slingerlands and Gilderland. And if you're from those areas, you know what I'm talking about. Here's holly getting eaten, rhododendron. Um, you know, they used to not eat rhododendron. Dave and I were discussing this earlier, uh, but they love it. So we'll get into strategies now. Um, Let's see, there's, um, the, oh yeah. The first thing to understand the most, and really important thing is that deer follow patterns and understanding this is gonna help you um, deal with deer. So you want to um, recognize how they are moving across your property and you wanna pattern them away from your property. So. Um, you want to prevent them from establishing the patterns in your yard. And, you know, you do this by making your yard less attractive and um, uh, inhospitable. So the first thing when you are trying to keep the patterns from establishing themselves on your property and from um, um, sorry, um, don't attract them to your yard. Um, and here is a, this is what you absolutely don't want. When they have, when they uh, have made your house a part of their daily pattern, they're gonna bed down right in your yard. Um, they're gonna see your place as really safe. And um, you know, I, 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 this is my customers that have the worst deer problems, have them bedding down on the property. They also have the worst tick problems um, but we can we can't grow anything at, at these places, um, and it's it you know it's very very frustrating. So this is what you don't want. If you have this and you have you have your work cut out for you, you want to try to break this the patterns of of them seeing your property as safe, and you want to kind of move them along so that they um, um, establish new patterns, probably at your neighbor's house. But <laughs> all is fair when it comes to gardening. 
Yeah. So the number one thing is don't attract them. And this is what I have found to be true across um, a lot of my customers' houses is that bird feeders bring the deer in. So first, don't attract them. And bird feeders attract a lot of deer. Um, it's basically a, a deer feeding station, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you, you'll just see, uh, you know, when, when there's different damage happening across different parts of a neighborhood, um, I think it's associated with bird feeders. They're actually moving from bird feeder to bird feeder. That's a guess of mine. I'm not a wildlife biologist, but it kind of makes sense um, that they're going to, you know, they keep moving through the day and um, because they're, they're browsers, they'll, they, they nibble as they go. And then they move to a feeder. They feed for a while. They'll go and bed down for a while and then move along to another yard with a feeder. And um, so I, this is the first piece of advice that I give people is don't, uh, feed birds, at least not this way. There's better ways. Um, and this is another reason I tell people not to do it because it brings in all kinds of other uh, pests too. And sorry for this rat picture, but it's true. They bring in everything. So you might not realize it, but it's true. I, I love feeding birds and I, I still do. I just use different methods, but I used to do a lot of seed feeding and I stopped. Um, so I recommend um, going to suet instead of seed feeders. Um, and a lot of you are probably familiar with suet. It's this solid um, uh, cake-like product and some people make it. You can buy it, I buy big boxes of it and um, it brings in lots of birds. Um, I got my parents to switch to suet uh, a while ago. They live in the middle of nowhere and they didn't really have much of a deer problem at all. There's hardly any deer out there, but because of the feeders, um, they were coming right in and then just mowing down everything in their front yard. Um, and as this was happening for years and years, um, they switched to the suet feeder and they're bringing in almost as many birds, not quite as many. Um, but if you also do bird baths, then you're really providing a lot of attraction for birds. And um, the heated baths work really, really well. So this is what I recommend going to. It just doesn't make as much of a mess and the deer don't have access to it. So it's just not attractive. So it's, I think it's a much better solution. And then also plant bird friendly uh, shrubs and perennials. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is a great way to do it. Um, I, I, and this is what keeps birds uh, zooming in and out of our property all day. Uh, we have all kinds um, and I love adding um, new shrubs and and tr and trees and perennials that that they uh, are attracted to. It brings in all kinds of different birds too. This is a cedar waxwing here. On cra you know, crab apple with a small fruit like that brings in quite a few birds. They'll hit that for for a long time. Aronia is a nice plant too. I don't plant it too much. The deer sometimes do hit this, but it's a it's a native shrub. It's not for every yard, but it is a nice picture of a bird. Um, echinacea is great. Uh, the deer generally leave echinacea alone. Woodchucks go after it, but um, they uh, this brings in goldfinches. Um, and winterberry holly is one of my favorites for birds. Uh, it, they lose their, their berries later in the season, so they're attractive. They look great for, month, for months, and then they're the last thing that the birds will usually go for. So I really like that one. This is my favorite um bird attracting tree i have a bunch of these um they kind of naturalized here they're a native uh dogwood pagoda dogwood cornus alternifolia um and they're effective for a long time these uh berries uh ripen and they hold them for weeks it seems like and the birds come down and fight over them and it's very exciting um i love this plant it's not that common but if um, it's great for shade. It's great for sun. Um, I think it's an awesome tree and it should be planted more often. It's a little sh short lived, but, um, compost bins also bring in lots of, um, deer. Just the smell of them will bring, bring them in because they're very, they're like naturally intelligent and, and curious. Um, and if they can't get into the bin, then other animals will be pulling things out that they can get to. So, you know, I tell people, 
you know, if you have to um, compost, then use like one of those worm composters or a uh, service. Um, so another way to not make your place um, attractive is if you notice that they're coming in just a few plants, then think about it, taking out those plants that they really love before they get those patterns established and replace them, you know, things that they really love. They love roses. I don't know how they eat roses, but they do. And they, they hit them everywhere I've ever put them or wherever I see them planted, they'll, they'll mow them right down. And uh, daylilies they love, hydrangeas of all kinds they love. So if you notice them starting to nibble on something, but they're really not well established in your yard, think about pulling that plant, give it to your friend and put in something that's deer proof or deer resistant. Um, this is bad news because everybody loves hydrangeas, but they love hydrangeas. They, uh, especially the macrophylla, um, all the endless summer varieties, all this, this type of blue and pink and all the, um, the different um, varieties of it. I love this plant, um, but they, you know, th this is one I see them just devour. And even if, even if it doesn't totally kill, they, they don't kill it, it'll, it'll never flower. You'll, you'll never see a flower on it. So, you know, don't try it if you have deer around. Um, same thing with the paniculata varieties, the tree form ones are the better way to go because they're taller. Uh, and there's a lot of different tree form. Um, quick fire is one and there's all kinds of, uh, of uh, tree form hydrangeas. This is um, one of my favorites to use, even in deer country. I use it a lot because it, uh, it's an excellent plant, but anything at ground level, they'll, they'll eat. Um, unfortunately, uh, oak leaf is one of my favorite uh, for shade, part, you know, part shade and sun. Um, I love this plant, but um, I don't dare use it anywhere there's uh, deer. Um, and then the other hydrangea, most of you are familiar with the Annabelle, and these are wonderful. I love them. Sometimes you can get away with these, but as the pressure builds one year, they'll just, they'll just decide, oh, we like Annabelle, and they'll just mow them down. So, which is kind of sad, because this is one of the, Dave and I were talking, like, we don't have a long list of plants we can grow in the Northeast. And this is the group that's like the most colorful, uh, the best behaved as far as size goes. And, and this is one that deer just absolutely love. Um, so yeah, now I'll move on. So we we're talking about, you know, not attracting them to your yard. Um, so now we'll talk about deterring them or repelling them when you want to make a go of like, uh, there's a plant you must have, like you really want to have a hydrangea. Well, um, you know, you're going to put it in, you're going to kind of hide it from them, and you're going to use deterrents and repellents to keep them off of it. Um, they all work, you know, to some degree. Some people think like, oh, this is uh, one that's, that works really well, and that one doesn't work really well. I mean, I haven't really found a huge difference in them. I think that they all work to one degree or another. Um, I've used a little different kinds. Um, you know, there's no there's no one that you're going to buy, especially one that you're going to order off the internet that they make with, you know, they make claims that it's, that it works really, really well. Um, that's going to be just a, you spray it and forget it and they, they never eat again. I just haven't found that to be true. Um, when they're well established in your yard, almost no sprays work. Um, sprays are great to work when you're at that light or moderate pressure level and you want to deter them and pattern them away. So um, it's really important to um, you know, you know, use the deterrence at that level, but don't expect when you're when you, when they are at the worst level possible and they're eating everything that a spray is going to be a magic wand. It just isn't, uh, but it's a tool. So um, you know, I I always tell people use what's available locally, um, um, and I like to use ready to uh, ready to use sprays because um, mixing and loading is annoying. Um, and it's messy and often these things are smelly. Um, and so I like to buy the ones that are ready to use. And I also, I recommend for my customers, they buy one that has an electric pump built into it, um, which is just great because the most important thing is to use the, the spray. If it's annoying to use, annoying to mix, annoying is a chore, you're not gonna do it as often as you need to. So I'll go over some tips about using them in a second, but I just wanted to show you um, um, you know, that there's, 
Uh, this is one that I really like. Uh, this is available locally at like Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff. And um, it this is actually not one of the, this one's called Tomcat Deer Repellent. And um, it has, it's more like a mint based uh, spray. And so it, it doesn't have that horrible uh, rotten egg smell that a lot of them uh, have like this one here, like Liquid Fence has putrescent eggs and other things in it. And it, it works, but it's nasty. I just don't like using it. But um, you know, this one, I use it, I use it especially when I plant new things. Um, um, you know, that's that's one of the, uh, the funny things about deer is that we'll often be attracted to the newest thing you just planted. And even if it's deer resistant, supposedly, they'll go right to it and say, oh, what's this? And they'll hit it. So I always spray, I keep this in my truck. And whenever I plant something new, I just spray it down um, just in case, you know, there's something that, and it works on for bunnies and stuff too. Um, this is a granular. It's good to use multiple things at once when you're dealing with a heavy pressure situation. Um, so granular goes right down under the plants, right on top of the mulch. And then you know spray the top with the uh, with the deer spray. Um, anything that is you know with these granulars, often they're only effective in the the like the 18 inches from the ground. Um, you know I've seen I've seen people use uh, soaps and things like Irish Spring. They'll cut it up around. It's kind of the same idea. Um, you know I I think everything is worth a try. Um, you know, but um, here's some tips switch it up every few months. Um, if you're using one spray, um, introduce another one after, you know, if you start with one in May, then switch up by end of July or middle of July um, to a different one, just so they don't get used to it. That's when you have a lot of deer around and they're constantly moving through your yard. Um, you know, there's rule, there's um, directions on all the sprays on how often to use them. And often it's something like spray once per week for the first three weeks, and then every three weeks thereafter, something like that. And I think un unlike um, a lot of other products like fertilizer or pesticide, with this stuff, more probably is better. <laughs> if you sprayed once a week, that's probably a good thing because it's just keeping the concentration of that, um, whatever it is on there that's um, deterring them. It's whether it's capsaicin or egg solids or mint oils at a higher concentration so that it's you know, that they, they keep, it deters them. Um, so I say spray often once a week, you know, um, after it rains, don't spray right after it rains because it's going to dilute the spray. So make sure it dries and then spray the new plants. Um, even if they're deer and rodent proof, like I was just mentioning, and then spray the perimeter of your property. If you have a heavy pressure area, um, spray the, everything that they, that even things they don't eat or have never eaten, just spray everything on your property at nose level. It'll just keep them moving through your property. That's your idea. You want to pattern them away. So that's how you do it. Just spray everything and it just keeps them, um, hopefully the idea would be to keep them moving. Uh, barrier fencing works really, really well when it's done right. Um, and then you're free. You can plant whatever you want, but it has its, uh, you know, it's a hassle. It's expensive. Um, you know, there's limits to uh, what you can do. So, you know, the idea is just to make it annoying enough so that the deer won't jump in um, while keeping the cost and difficulty down. If you're talking about a small area, like a vegetable garden, generally you don't need a nine foot fence. But if you have a long run that's very open like this farm field here, um, you're gonna want a tall fence. But for the typical suburban lot, you can get away with, um, like seven feet's a good compromise or even six feet when there's a lot of foliage around. So I've done fencing for people. It's a, it's a big job. It's probably should be left to professionals to do it right. Um, and ordering the stuff, if you want to do it, I wouldn't buy the stuff at Home Depot. These two manufacturers, well, manufacturer, they're um, uh, distributors online. These are my two favorite ones. I've ordered from both of them. They're excellent. And they have a higher quality product than you can get at Home Depot. Um, another important thing, though, is you should pin any fencing to the ground because they'll go under more often than they'll jump. That's important to know. And if you use a uh, plastic fence, woodchucks and rabbits will chew perfect little holes right through. And then the deer will go through those little, they'll nose their way through those little holes. So metal fence is better. Sometimes you can put a metal fence at the bottom of the plastic fence. Um, so 
I do a lot of winter fencing just for the winter. This is one that was a juniper. Um, I love this juniper. It's a, a native juniper, uh, juniper is Virginiana, and it's emerald sentinel, which holds a lot of berries. And so it brings a lot of birds in, even in winter, um, but very prone to deer damage. So I put up a little fence. This is four foot. Um, it's not, you can't really see it. I, I, if I do this for a customer, I might paint this black so you can't really see it. But, um, it, you know, it's not great, but it works. It keeps them off. And this, this plant will be safe and better able to uh, get a good good growth for the season. Um, and that's something that um, fencing can do. See, this is just to show you, this is four foot tall, just standing off the foliage. Um, it doesn't have to be a work of art. You know, here, I have this in my house. I wanted this rhododendron, even though they've eaten all the other rhododendrons. I had to have this one, so I decided I'm going to put this fence in. This one's such a cool color of rhododendron I had never seen before, so I just loved it. Um, you know, one of the ideas with fencing is to protect a, tr a plant for like the first few years, especially one that might be deer resistant, that once a plant is well established, it can rebound from deer damage easier than one that you just planted. Um, you just plant it, it doesn't have a lot of roots, it gets hit by deer, and then it languishes trying to grow after that injury. Whereas a plant that's in the ground two, three years, it's established, you've kept them off with the deer fencing, and then the, you can take that deer fencing away, and if it's a resistant plant, like a viburnum of some sort, even if they start to nibble on it, they, they, they're basically just pruning it a little bit for you. So, you know, that's like one strategy is just fence things for the first uh, couple years um, and then um, kind of let them go. You can't really do that with evergreens, but with some other shrubs, you can. This is to do a bunch of for them by my house. Um, um, you know, four foot fence stood off. I do this for, for arborvitaes too um, and all, all evergreens. Just it doesn't have to be a lot. This is easy to handle plastic fencing that I buy from those manufacturers. Um, it's already cut to four foot, so I don't have to cut it. And I just use wood stakes. You can also use metal, thin metal stakes. And it works great. It's peace of mind. It's not pretty. They look like they're in jail. It's kind of sad, but um, this is a vegetable garden. Doesn't need to be tall. They're not gonna hop that. It's just too much trouble for them. Um, so they ignore it and it works great. Um, here's a few new products that are out now. Um, this is a systemic um, uh, repellent and it makes the plant spicy. So it has capsaicin in it. And um, you sprinkle it around the base or it comes in a pellet, you push the pellet in around the plant. It get, it takes it up systemically and uh, then it, it, it um, moves the capsaicins into the leaf of the plant. So uh, a rodent or a deer takes a bite I'm trying it out. I've done it for two seasons now. I'm still trying to decide if it's worth it, but it sounds like a good idea. I'm going to give it a try. When it comes to deer, you just try everything. Um, this is a really interesting one. I'll show you another picture in a second. This is a, a called Plot Saver. It was developed by people protecting their uh, alfalfa fields, um, and gardeners found it useful. And this one really does work well. Um, it's a ribbon, and I'll, I'll show you a picture in a second. And I'll talk about the sprinkler in a second too. Let me go on to the picture. Um, here is that plot saver. Well, actually, this is one I made myself because I'm kind of a cheapskate. So I went and bought black plastic ribbon and I put it on these thin, um, I just want that way you can see where this ribbon goes uh, on these thin uh, posts. This is only about, I think, 24 inches or, or 30 inches high. And it's right at about nose level for the deer. And I sprayed this black ribbon with uh, deer off any of those uh, sprays. And so it's just a little barrier just to prevent them from walking into your garden in the middle of summer. Um, so these are all deer resistant plants here. And then um, inside of there are plants that they do like to eat like zinnias and things. And it seemed to work. You know, um, they did reach under and grab this um, persicaria um, which was too bad, but so I might try another layer of this, but I think this is a good idea for people who have really bad um, uh, deer pressure and they want to try to pattern them away. So protecting all your beds with something like this ribbon 
Um, if, or if you have like a prize uh, daylily collection or something, this might be worth trying instead of putting up a whole fence, just a light ribbon like this, it makes it easier to get in and out. And it's inexpensive and it's easy to do. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I'm, I'm gonna do more of this at, at my house this year. Um, there's a motion activated sprinkler. I've never tried these, but I would think it probably would work. I think it's a good idea. The only downside I could see is that you might have leaky hoses or something. You have water like leaking. Uh, you have to keep your spigot on all the time. So that's kind of a problem. Almost everybody has leaky spigots. Um, and then this is another one, deer ribbon. This is with embedded, um, uh, embedded with like whatever they're using as a deterrent. And um, you can kind of coil it up on top of a plant. You can use it as like that ribbon I just showed you, tying it to stakes, or you can put it on the ground or just uh, lay it over the top of a shrub. I think that will is probably a good idea. I haven't tried it yet. Um, this was on Amazon. Ooh, are we almost done, David? Um, okay. Yeah, we're getting to the witching hour, but okay. a few more things. This. Okay. Um, this, oh yeah, one thing that definitely doesn't work is are the motion, or not the motion, but the sound-based things. Oh, they're they're terrible. They just annoy landscapers and they don't work. <laughs> um, so design, uh, big daffodil plantings can be great. Use deer resistant plants. That's obviously uh, you know, um a good thing to do, except most of the lists I see are not very good. I mean, not because the people don't know what they're talking about, it's just because deer are different everywhere you go and, and everybody's in different stages of deer uh, pressure and you know what works in one place doesn't work in another so you just have to be skeptical of all of these lists and don't over um, invest on a plant when you're not sure if it's going to be uh, resistant this is a uh, just a image to show you how effective one plant can be you know if you have a problem area and you you can just like and there's a back corner of a yard this is burning bush it's been there for a long time. The deer don't eat it. It just is beautiful. It's sitting there. Uh, no one has to touch it, prune it, do anything to it. Look how effective that is. Um, so why would you take out a burning bush and then put in, try to put in something else when it's just, um, you know, you let it get to its natural beauty. And there it is. Um, this is what you can do with like nice deer resistant plants in full sun, the sandy soil, uh, lavender, um, uh, this is a really nice plant that I like to use, Onethera, um, Siskiyou, and it's it spreads like crazy, but a uh, very nice plant. It's a little invasive. Um, you can go up with trees, very, very good way to see so you can grow hydrangea in deer country, like I was saying, because you're out of the deer zone. Um, this is lilac. They don't like lilac too much. Cherry, they do eat. So you can, you know, trees are effective up high. So, you know, you have to use that zone out when you're in deer country to get your effects. Um, this is a, just to show you how there's a, a browse line here, but this is something they didn't eat. You know, it's Norway spruce. So that's what deer resistant plants can do. That's a compact form of Norway spruce. It's not gonna turn into a giant tree. It's, it's a, a dwarf. So I really like that plant. Um, you can plant larger trees when you're putting in your, your trees so that you're up out of the zone to begin with. These are just two, three years old red buds. And these, um, you know, even though the deer are eating down below, it doesn't matter. A great thing to do, obviously, uh, is um, use stonework. I do this, you know, in very shady areas, but also in deer areas where you just can't get a lot of plants to grow. Well, put in something they can eat. So stone, stonework just adds a lot to the garden and, um, you know, it doesn't, can't be eaten. And then my customers put these chairs here. And I think that adds a tremendous amount to the garden, just that pop of color and, uh, you know, another deer proof element. Um, this garden's under heavy pressure, uh, but it still looks good. They were actually, they walk through this and, and eat as, you know, all kinds of things, but there's all this other stuff in here that they don't eat. So we have Cleome, um, that's a, a good solid deer proof plant, Amsonia, Allium, Celosia, Adriatum, variegated iris. It's effective as a nice variegated leaf and there's nothing for them to eat on that. Uh, this is a nice simple one with stone, with trees uh, that they, they can't get to. Um, 
Dutia over here. And this is one of my favorite deer proof grasses, Hakani Kloa. Um, it's a wonderful plant. Almost every garden should have these. Um, they, bunnies can be a problem sometimes. Um, here's Artemisia, they don't eat that. Here's Monarda, they don't eat that unless you're at my house. There's uh, Shastas, which you can you can get away with these. You know you're in that between light pressure and heavy pressure when you can, uh, uh, if you can grow Shastas, you're not in heavy pressure. Alliums and daffodils with a nice fount, you know, uh, bird bath fountain. You know, just this is in heavy uh, deer uh, pressure area, so you can still get quite a fit, a lot of things growing. Um, this is a great deer resistant tree, so this is going to get into some of my favorite picks. Um, seven sunflower, heptacodium. Uh, it's a wonderful tree, a uh, small, you know, maybe maybe 20 foot tall at maturity. This is a big one. I've had this in the ground for 15 years or 17 years, something like that. Um, this is a, the red bracts at the after it has a white flower in late uh, August and a, a, a really great tree. Uh, magnolias are in general deer resistant, although sometimes they'll nip them in certain places. Um, this is a Levner hybrid. This is a star magnolia, and this is one called Sensation. That's a yellow pink. It's really beautiful. Fringe tree is one of my favorite. Um, they don't seem to bother it too much. This is one you'd want to protect for the first year or two, let it get going, then you could take the fence away if you're in heavy deer. Uh, heavy heavy uh, pressure area. Fringe tree is a wonderful tree. It's a little hard to find, but should be planted a lot more often. Great fragrance. Uh, bottle brush buckeye. Um, this is uh, totally deer proof as far as I can tell. I've never seen them eat this. And it's a, a great shrub. It's large. You can control it with pruning. Um, it takes to it just, just fine. Um, but it can grow in, this is in full sun, and this is in dense shade right here, still flowers. It's a naturalistic plant, you know, it's, it's not like a, like a neat plant, but, um, you know, I, I love it. It's one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> double five viburnum is a, a must for, uh, you know, people in deer country. They generally leave this alone. They might hit it the first year or two, and then they'll just, they just don't have a taste for it, but I've seen them, you know, do a little bit of nibbling, and, um, there's the old standbys or Shasta and Marisei, but there's new ones. Um, Steady Eddie is one that I'm trying out. Um, Proven Winners, I think, is doing that one. And um, Summer Snowflake is an old one that is a little smaller. You can see it stays narrower. Great plant. Father Gilla. Um, that's this one here. I don't know. Yeah, this is Father Gilla. Great uh, fall color. Um, the flowers, a little underwhelming, little bottle brush flower, but a nice deer resistant shrub. Um, Lamium is a nice ground cover here. Um, everybody's maybe familiar with uh, uh, Lamium. Uh, Purple Dragon is a nice variety of it. And that back there is a witch hazel, um, but you can see it's tall, so they, you know, they stay away from it. So this just gives you an idea, of, again, of the what you can do when it's really heavy deer, it's hard to grow anything, but you can still have an effective area. Boxwood is a must for front yards to replace yews and, and other evergreens. They don't eat it. Um, Franklin's Gem is one of my favorite. And New Gen is one that is resistant to the blight that has that is that may be coming to our area. Um, there's a boxwood blight, but the um, breeders are coming out with resistant uh, varieties. And um, this New Gen is a, is a nice one. So boxwood is is a um a hard hard worker you know it's a it, it's always uh, this nice green and uh can be kept to a, a good size depending on your goals for your if it's your front you know foundation planting i you, you know you almost have to use these now because there's uh when there's deer around there's just not much else you can go to norway spruce like i mentioned before um there's um, you, they're great for screens for uh, darker areas, like even even like part sun or shade. Um, they're very adaptable. They're resistant to the needle cast diseases, unlike the blue spruces and and uh, Doug firs. And um, they come in all these forms. 
depending on what your goals are, there's like a nice narrow form. This could be used as a screen. It could be used as a specimen. Um, there's globe forms. So I love this plant. This is, um, I've had them damaged Norway spruce. I've been dismayed <laughs> to see them damaged. Uh, you know, you plant them, you're like, oh, deer proof. And they've hit them the first year. So now uh, when I, when there's a lot of deer around, I'll fence these for the first winter just to give them that chance to grow. Uh, microbiota is one of my standbys for ground cover type evergreen. Great plant. Look it up. Microbiota decusata. Um, it's a, this nice um, feathery evergreen. Andromeda is a great replacement for rhododendron if you can't grow rhododendron or holly for a broadleafed evergreen. Um, this one is a slow grower, um, but you can see different flowers available great emerging foliage. A lot of them have this, this is a uh, mountain fire. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice plant. It's a little touchy sometimes with uh, establishment. Don't overwater it and don't put it in a place with bad drainage. If it makes it the first year, you're probably fine. It'll last for a hundred years, but I don't know, maybe a third of the ones I plant don't make it, but I keep trying because it's a beautiful plant and the deer don't eat this. Ornamental grasses of all kinds almost are um, resistant. So everybody's like probably familiar with this one, but uh, Penicetum, I like Little Bunny, is a much more controllable size. This is one I use a lot, Calamagrostis avalanche. It's narrower and softer and it gets started early in the season. Unlike Miscanthus, which takes a long time to get going and can be very um, kind of stark looking in the, in the spring. Um, but this one, Morning Light, I think is my favorite. It's the nicest, it's small, has a great variegated leaf. Um, this penicetum is not hardy. Everybody thinks the rubrum is a uh, nice grass. They grow it, they put it in, then it dies uh, over winter. But um, it's a, um, a wonderful plant for the growing season, but it's an annual. Conicloa is what I, I mentioned before. Great shade grass. It lays over instead of standing upright. Um, and I like to mass them together. It creates a really beautiful effect in the shade garden, but even one like here, uh, Japanese painted fern, uh, European ginger. Um, and this is, there's some hostas in here, but that's, and that's a beautiful little combination. Here's a little blue stem. You'll see it often now in the nurseries. I think it's a bit of a disappointment. I, I love the plant. It, it's a native, it grows everywhere, but I've just found it to be kind of a disappointment in any kind of fertile soil. It flops over. Um, so prairie drop seeds, a better native. Um, I think it's a nice little clump former like that. And you can kind of mass it up, make a, a faux lawn effect, like an overgrown area like this. It has a, a cool scent in the flower that I like. Um, this one is one you'll see most often, a uh, blue oat grass, but it seems to rot very easily. And I've also found it to be disappointing. Uh, oat grass I have planted and then I've gotten a lot of seedlings and I've had to take it out uh, from several gardens because it can get really, really seedy, but in the right place, it's a cool plant. Um, this is a great um, uh, caryopter, ca caryopterus, uh, black knight, um, is, is deer proof. Great, um, if you don't want to plant a uh, butterfly bush, like, you know, butterfly bush, everybody knows that one. It's a great deer proof uh, shrub. Um, it can be seedy, you know, and, and spread around. This one doesn't. And, um, you know, also flowers around the same time. And I love this combination with the spirea in the background. Um, Wygelia is uh, one of my standbys for flowering shrubs. Um, this one's um, wine and roses, which many people may know, but it gets pretty big, bigger than people think. So I go for spilled wine or very fine wine. And there's lots of others, but read the tags because their sizes can be very different with Wigilia. Um, nine bark, um, a lot of people, the same thing with nine bark, people will plant them and think that they stay small. They, they really don't, they get quite large. But Little Devil and Tiny Wine are both excellent smaller varieties. And you can cut these to the ground every, like in March, every three, four years, and they'll control the size for you, but it's a great dark foliage shrub. Dutia is a wonderful shrub. Uh, I use it all the time. It's short, especially these yuki 
um, variety snowflake and cherry blossom. Um, here's a planting on a hillside of Yuki snowflake, um, two, three foot tall, suckering, so it'll kind of fill that whole area in, but a great deer resistant plant. And then the spireas are all, uh, everybody knows bridal reef, um, but there's a lot of new ones out there. And double play doozy, silly name, but a great plant. Emerging foliage is red, it's really nice. Um, and then you have like dwarf Korean lilac, which has been around a long time. Very good deer resistant plant, makes a nice informal hedge or by itself. Potentilla, Potentilla always gets rangy after a few years. So we just cut it to, cut it to the ground, like a, like a perennial in, in early spring and it'll just rejuvenate. And barberry, they're coming out with new barberry that are seedless. So, um, you know, that's been their problem is that they've spread everywhere and people don't like them for that, but they're really essential in, in when you have, when you have five plants you can put in, uh, you know, barberry does such a great job in the right place and the new varieties are seedless. So that's a great thing. Um, great shade perennials that I love, Jacob's Ladder, Hellebore, um, a great deer resistant plant, um, Brunera or Brunera. Um, wonderful. I like Al Alexander's great. Um, that one is, sorry, um, big, big leaf. And uh, I think bunnies leave that one alone too. And we've had, uh, this is a new type of bleeding heart I've been using, this fringed bleeding heart, smaller, prettier. And Virginia, surprisingly, has been deer resistant in our gardens. And then um, I have some perennials here. Uh, Agastache is a is a must have for if you can't grow uh, like Shasta daisies, you can grow Agastache, Allium, um, Digitalis of all kinds. I like this one, Arctic Rose. It's a beauty. Um, it might flower for you every year, um, unlike the others. I, um, cat's Mint uh, can get a little big, but Cat's Pajamas is a nice small variety that I that I love. And uh, um, Heliopsis Tuscan Sun has been a good performer in some gardens. It, um, not all the Heliopsis perform very well, but this one seems to be pretty solid. And then Threadleaf Damsonia is um, a wonderful plant. It's um, the only real deer-proof Amsonia I know of. The other ones all seem to get hit, but this one they don't like. And um, it, it's a great like uh, grass alternative if you don't want to do ornamental grass. Um, and then Alcamilla mollis is a must have this one for uh, deer country. They don't bother it. Um, and it's just an old standby. And here's some annuals, Adjuranum, Alyssum, Salvia, Cleomi. Oh, I think I've gotten to the end. Lamiastrum is a great ground cover um, that uh, the deer leave alone. It grows in a dense, dense shade. So very nice plant. And then, uh, so yeah, it's just a little bit of takeaways. First of all, don't attract deer to your garden. Make your garden unpalatable, pattern them away. Um, apply deterrents regularly and switch them up. Use fences if you have to, to pattern them away, keep them off your property in the winter. And um, design your garden to have multiple dimensions of interest with all kinds of elements. If you're just trying to build beauty into the garden. If you can't do it with as many plants and do it with other things, and then choose the right plants and put them in the right place. I think that's it. Excellent. Wow. I like all the local knowledge. So oh, good. Thank you, Ben. That was really, really good. I mean, it was a great talk, but I think it was the most customized to the capital area that I've ever heard. So I good. like your knowledge of what's going on out there because you see a lot of this yeah, so, uh, yeah that's really good. super so thank you thank you i know it took a lot of work to put this together but we certainly appreciate it so let me see what we got in the chat box here and i'm going to ask you a couple questions yeah please do how about coyote urine it's worth a try um i can't say that um i've seen it work myself um but like with a lot of these things um, it's worth a try and and um, just follow the directions on the package and um, um, yeah, I, I would expect it to work like other deterrents. You know, um, the deer are either going to be 
Um, if they're if you have heavy pressure, I doubt that it'll work very well. But if you're trying to keep them away and pattern them away, then it might contribute to that. You know that plus your sprays plus your granulars. You know, you know that is, it's definitely worth a try. So you talked about following the directions, um, and then I think you said you couldn't spray too much. So somebody asked about how often. I think we talked about that, but how about malorganite? Do you have any feelings well, about that? Um, I've heard, I mean, I've only heard that that um, I've used it um, as like a fertilizer sometimes, and I've heard that it's a deer deterrent. So I'd expect it to work like the granular at the ground level. But if you read about those granular, when you apply it, it's really only effective in the top, like 18, 24 inches. Um, so, you know, use that at the ground level, but be careful about applying something like malorganite because it is a fertilizer. So you could over fertilize, you know, and that, yeah. And that leads into the next question. What effect do these sprays or repellents have on the rest of the environment? Uh, well, the repellents are really just, um, you know, soap, capsaicin, which is like hot sauce, uh, putrescent egg solids, um, and, and a couple other things. They're really not, they're not like insecticides or pesticides or anything. Um, so, you know, are they going to have an effect? Yeah, everything you put in the environment has an effect, but, um, you know, is it going to cause like bird death? No, I don't think so. Is it going to cause insect death? Um, you, know, I, you know, if you're spraying uh, soaps around, well, yeah, you'll have an effect on, on insects, but um, I, you know, I don't think that, um, you know, everything is a trade-off. So, you know, either you're, you're trying to protect your plants, um, you know, uh, you, and you don't want to use anything that's noxious, but I don't think these things really are. So. Yeah, most of these are fairly simple compounds that are going to mm -hmm. break down and they're not going to have a long-term impact. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about cat mint? Oh, I love cat mint. I mentioned one. Um, Nepeta is the genus and it's, um, uh, cat mint, the, the typical one you'll find, um, is, well, I guess there's a few different plants called catnip or uh, cat mint. Um, but the one Nepeta is, um, uh, Walker's low. You'll see most of the time. And that's a great plant, but it gets really wide. It gets like three, four feet wide. So these new ones they're coming out with are cat's pajamas or other names like that. To, to control them. And that it's something that's happening across the plant breeding industry is they're, they're breeding plants to be smaller, better behaved, uh, which I love because you can fit more plants in, in a smaller space, unless you have a large scale garden. Most of the gardens I work in are like suburban plots. So um, I, I don't get a chance to do really large scale. Um, so I'm trying to you know get a lot of interest in a small space. So um, you know look for those, those new varieties that are smaller. But it's totally um, dear, that one. And, yeah. and bunny. That's a good, I'll have to look for cat's pajamas. I didn't know about that. <laughs> I oh, love the yeah. names. Yeah. Uh, the questioner is asking about which of these are native plants. Well, gee, most of them are not going to be native because deer are going to love native plants, right? Yeah, unfortunately, that's true. They, they've evolved with the plants. And so they um, have... Uh, you know, they, they do eat them, but uh, there was a few natives that I mentioned in there. Um, um, there's, um, oh gosh, what's, oh, the pagoda dogwood is a wonderful uh, native tree. Um, our native of uh, Cornus, Florida is also a good one. Um, you know, if you want to go up above the deer zone, you can plant anything native um, and then anything that is standardized. So it's like uh, grown on a on a stem and then has foliage up above. So there's um, some native plants or native shrubs are grown that way. But um, uh, there's, you know, you, you know, aronia is a native one, but they they eat that one. Um, Clethra is a near native, but they they love that plant. You know, I've seen them, them destroy Clethra, you know. So unfortunately, you're right. A lot of our natives are preferred by deer. Um, yeah, I think it's typical. Yeah, it goes, there, there's there's a few though that uh, that that they don't eat. You know, it's just you have to experiment. Um, how about are these going to be hardy in Warrensburg? Most of them probably would be, right? Yes, I think mostly. Yeah, because you're what are they? Uh, are they four there? Yeah, they'd be another zone colder than us, right? At least one more zone. Yeah. 
Yeah, so probably four. You know, I, I, I think you're probably fine with almost everything there. Because I, 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 I stick onto the on the very hardy side of, of most of the plants that I choose because I don't want to have to replace anything. So, um, you know, there are... You know, there's a, there's there's some that are marginal here that sometimes I'll use in the city gardens, but um, you know, being away from the cities, I, I stick to the the very hardy plants. So, um, people are asking if the slides are available or PowerPoint, but what we're going to do is we will put this presentation on YouTube. So eventually, don't go there tomorrow because it won't happen that fast. But after we do processing to it. Uh, if you go to YouTube, type in Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County, you'll come to our channel, and this will be saved there on our channel. So uh, that would be where you could go to see it. So I think that looks like about it. I want to say thank you to everybody that was here today. And we had about 60 people, so that's super. Thank mm -hmm. you for participating. And we certainly want to thank Ben for his uh, knowledge information wow 